categories on the vertex operator is please. Thank you. Yeah, so this is, um, uh, in my talks again, I'm trying to, I'm getting a strange echo. Is that just because of where I'm standing or is it okay? Everything's okay? Okay, good. Yeah, so um, in my lectures, I'm trying to uh, indicate um, the value um, of tensor category methods for practical questions in VOAs. And so, um, so the first lecture, if you remember, I'm going to have to stand in a different spot. The first lecture yeah, was um, about the background. So it introduced um, the two stars of my talks are going to be fusion categories and um, modular tensor categories. So the relation of modular tensor categories to VOAs is very clear. Nice VOAs, their representation theory is captured by a modular tensor category. If I stand here, I don't get an echo, so that's great. So I might be standing here an awful lot. Um, modular, the, the connection of Connection of um, modular tensor of um, VOAs to fusion categories is a little less direct, but it's also very important, as we'll see right away. Okay, but before I, I go much further, I should um, tell you about a. I should tell you a secret. So this is my personal bias. So this affects pretty much everything that I ever do. How I raise children, etc. Um, so there's a Witten at the turn of the century was asked to predict um, what the next century is like. So this is. Hilbert plus 100 years. And, um, and so Witten um, said that um, quantum field theory, making sense, trying to make sense of quantum field theory is going to be one of the keys of 21st century mathematics. Um, now, so the way that I kind of think of this as is um, we had a similar thing happening when, when classical mechanics was invented um, by Newton et al. And um, that transformed mathematics. It, it, begat, it begat calculus, and through that, um, Many decades later, it begat analysis, symplectic geometry, et cetera, et cetera. So that was an incredible gift from physics to mathematics. And we're in a situation which is analogous, but far more interesting. A quantum field theory is a vastly more interesting beast, vastly more subtle and complicated and deep than, um, than classical mechanics. And so we should expect, um, so my bias is that we should be expecting to see in the 21st century a revolution of mathematics that's um, that dwarfs what happened in um, 300 years ago, or maybe it was 500, I'm not good with numbers, but it was a long time ago when we had calculus being invented and all of the consequences of that. And so that's what I'm looking for. And so I, I wanna, so that's why I'm, I'm interested in physics is the gifts that, it, that it's giving, that it should give, that it will surely give mathematics in, in our century and my lifetime. Um, now the problem is, so, so I'm looking at everything through that critical eye, so I want to see a revolution. So I want to see um, new concepts coming in, like really new concepts coming in, and um, and so and it's it's hard to see that yet. So there's great exciting things. It's a, it's the golden time of mathematics, but uh, um, but is this an accident of of it still being the early days? Um, so that's the question that I'm going to address in the first part of my my or try to address in the first part of my talk today. So let's just remind us the. Um, the, this is a slide I've used before. So it just puts it into a bigger context, what we're talking about. So the layer that we're probably most interested in is the purple layer. Um, that's the quantum field theory level. Um, and so if we're, if we're going to follow Witten's advice, then the first place surely to look is two-dimensional conformal field theory. So that's where that should be the most accessible to us right now. And we're pouring in, as we're all evidence of it, um, we're all pouring in lots of effort into that part of the story. And um, on the bottom layer, you have the, the layer that everyone is comfortable with. Um, so this is the combinatorial layer. So things like um, you know, characters of your VOAs or things like um, modular data, um, things like fusion rings, that kind of thing. And in, in the middle row is, um, is the tensor category row. So it's sort of halfway in between. It's not quite as terribly complicated as the top row. And it's not quite as terribly friendly um, or um, What's that word that isn't too condescending? Um, um, it's not as um, sort of, it doesn't forget as much information as the bottom layer. So it's sort of a sweet, it's a bit of a sweet spot. So I'm going to try to argue that that row has a lot to tell us about the top row. Okay, um, so um, the richest structures here are the top layer. So we're going to focus on 
vector, vec um, vertex operator algebras, but there's lots of, of equivalents, like conformal nets, for example, and um, factorization algebras, chiral algebras, etc. cetera. Um, now, it's really hard to construct VOAs, um, and, um, and um, so the most familiar ones that we know um, are, are, are fairly directly uh, constructed using um, what you could call classical um, things. So there's been some very interesting work um, in recent years um, by, uh, that, that create VOAs that are much more subtle, and much more effort to create, and you get whole new families of these things, and this is very exciting. I love group theory and lead theory. I love it. It's touched every area of work I've ever done. Um, but so I'm, I'm not trying to be cynical here. I'm, I'm just trying to say, uh, can we can we try to find other things? It's kind of analogous, maybe. There's always an analogy to finite groups. So um, um, so the, the finite the list of finite simple groups um, has uh, something like 16 families of groups of Lie type. So these are things that you can build up in clever ways from Lie theory. So this is almost all of the the finite simple groups. Um, and so, so um, I don't mean to say that those are the boring ones. Those are the generic ones. Um, but there are some, some weirder ones. So certainly the, the monster finite simple group is a much more exotic finite simple group than um, some group in the middle of one of these um, Lie theory uh, families, Lie type families. So that's what I'm trying to find. Are there sort of analogs of, of um, really exotic VOAs? OK. Um, yeah, so that's what I'm talking about here. I don't want to belabor this point. So what we're doing is we're searching for, what I'm trying to do in this first part is use tensor categories to search for some of this exoticness that I'm hoping to find, that I think we're all, many of us are hoping to find in, um, in, the, 20th first, in the 21st century math that's coming out of, um, of quantum field theories, conformal field theories. So just for the sake of this talk, let's, call, let's focus on the representation theory, because that's my main interest in things like VOAs. And I think that's true for most of us, or many of us. So let's call a modular tensor category or a fusion category exotic if there's no um, way to build it up from Lie theory or finite groups that we know of right now. Or, uh, so it's extremely complica complicated. We have to use ad hoc methods to construct it. And let's call a VOA exotic if its category of modules is exotic in this sense. Okay, so we're, we're trying to search for exotic VOAs, and we might discover that there are none. I mean. Um, but right now, I think there's, I don't know if there's any that are known that are exotic in this sense. So, um, so that's our challenge. And so um, the biggest problem is how in the world do we ever find these exotic VOAs or exotic categories if our only methods are classical methods? We haven't invented really other methods yet. So that's the, that's the challenge. Okay, well, there's two strategies that we could follow. One is extensions. So you take a pretty boring, I shouldn't say that. You take a standard VOA, um, and, um, and then you extend it. And, uh, and then um, w with luck, you can create a, a more interesting VOA, a less standard one. So extensions sound like a pretty trivial thing, but in general, the extensions can be quite complicated. And uh, so we'll talk about this. Um, I, I think later today, we'll be able to talk, start talking about that. Another approach is, is the opposite, sub-VOAs. Start with a standard VOA and look at sub-VOAs inside it. These sound like maybe stupid things, if you have something that's boring or standard, then anything inside it is boring or standard. But actually, that's completely false. Um, look at group theory, for example. We have Cayley's theorem, which tells us that every group, the monster, lies in some symmetric group. So the symmetric groups are as standard as there is in groups, as far as groups are concerned. But inside the symmetric groups are every single other group. But that's just a dumb way to think about the monster. And so, But you could think about the monster that way. So, so just because you're um, you're going inside a standard thing, you're going a little bit outside a standard thing doesn't mean that um, you're, you're dealing with something that's in any way standard. So anyways, these are, these are the two approaches. And so the approach I'm going to talk about right now in, in this part of this talk is the sub-VOA method. Now, the easiest way to come up with a sub-VOA is to have a group of automorphisms that act on your VOA. And then you look at the fixed points of that group of automorphisms. And so we'll talk about that tomorrow. It's a very important construction. It's called the Orbifold construction of VOAs. But um, as far as modular tensor categories are concerned, um, these aren't going to be really different from the, the thing that you started with. If you started with a standard um, a VOA, a standard modular tensor category, um, and um, you, you do the orbifold construction, then the result should be some kind of a group theory amplification of your, um, 
of the category you started with. So it's not going to be, if the first wasn't exotic, then it would be hard to claim that, that this is going to be exotic. So um, a more interesting version is to take orbifolds folds by fusion categories. So I said on Monday that you, you can think of, in a way that hasn't been completely spelt out yet, but it's certainly true, you can think of fusion categories as a 21st century finite group. And so anything you do with a finite group, there should be, you should be able to do something like it with a fusion category if you interpret it appropriately. And so, um, so what we're going to talk about now is orbifolds of nice, friendly, um, boring, or friendly, um, VOAs by um, weird, exotic fusion categories. And the result will be an exotic modular tensor category. And if there's a VOA that corresponds to it, it'll be an exotic VOA. So that's our strategy right now. OK, so, um, so um, um, I don't think anyone's officially defined what a rational VOA is yet. And um, so I, I think this is an adequate definition for now. It's more like it's the criteria that um, Huang needs to get a modular tensor category. So if I dropped a condition or I have redundant conditions, who cares? That's not a, a big deal um, for me right now. There's a definition of a very nice class of VOAs. It, it doesn't mean that they're the, they're the ones that you should focus on. It's analogous to Lie algebras. So finite dimensional um, simple Lie algebra is extremely special and has wonderful properties and it's very nice. But maybe by modern standpoints, it's also kind of boring and um, you want to go beyond it. So you certainly want to look at other finite dimensional Lie algebras. You also want to look at infinite dimensional Lie algebras, like the affine algebras, Katsumudi, et cetera. But, um, but um, a very nice class of them. The place to really start and really understand where you can have a really rich theory is the finite dimensional simple. And the rational VOAs is the analog of that here. OK, so we know that, um, that their category of, rep of modules, the representation theory of these VOAs, is a modular tensor category. That's a, an important theorem by Huang. Um, and um, so in one direction, when you're going from your VOA to your modular tensor category, it's an infinity to one map. So infinitely many different VOAs have the same uh, modular tensor category. So lots of information is lost. So this might sound like a terrible thing. It's a terrible thing, and it's a great thing, because that's what math is, the interplay between forgetful functors and enhancing. So you want to walk back and forth. So this, this means looking at the modular tensor category is, um, is going to be a lot simpler than looking at the VOA. Um, so information is lost. In the other direction, um, it's much more mysterious. So how surjective is this map? So if you, if you have a modular tensor category, does it have to come from a rational VOA? And so um, the conjecture right now, I think most people probably are leaning toward this being true. So it's called the reconstruction conjecture. And so the idea is that any modular tensor category comes from a rational VOA. Um, so the evidence for this, the reason I believe in this is, um, is just because there's lots of places where this could go wrong. For example, um, the, cat, the modular data, so that's a representation of SL2Z you get from a modular tensor category. It has to contain a congruent subgroup, a gamma N, whatever that means. It has to contain that in the kernel of this representation, or there's no way it can come from a VOA. And it turns out, uh, miraculously, that it always does. And there's lots of other places where um, you think there's zero chance, uh, so almost, so zero percent of all representations of SL2Z are congruence representations. But the ones that come from modular tensor categories are congruence representations. And there's lots of other of these um, coincidences that are infinitely improbable. And um, everyone we've checked checks out. So that's why I think that, uh, you know, God is, uh, can sometimes be a, a bit of a jerk, but certainly um, um, she's not that misleading. So usually there's hints early on that, that you're going down the wrong path. So I believe in the reconstruction conjecture. It wouldn't be devastating to me if it's not true, but um, for now I'm going to work with the assumption that it's, it's true. So we can live in the world of modular tensor categories. The great thing about that is they're much simpler, as we just talked about. And so you can do stuff with modular tensor categories that would be very hard to do in the lofty world of VOAs. And so you could do things with them, construct them, for example. And then, um, and then, if, if, then if you're lucky or if the reconstruction conjecture is correct, then um, it lifts to a VOA. OK, so um, we're going to try to construct exotic modular tensor categories and then try to see if, um, if there's a VOA that corresponds to it. OK, we can talk about the space of all modular tensor categories. Um, so uh, we talked about these two tensor categories, fusion categories and modular tensor categories. And, um, and so 
um, one way to go from one way to get a modular tensor category is through the center construction or the Drinfeld double construction. So, given a fusion category, you can get a, t a modular tensor category by taking its center. So, it's completely analogous to taking the center of a ring. You get a commutative ring, and so the same kind of idea here goes on here. And so, um, so you get a short exact sequence. Um, so, this th these are actually monoids. You can, if you're given two modular tensor categories, you can create another one by um, by tensoring them together, the Deline product. It corresponds in the VOA language to taking the tensor product of your two VOAs. So it's a very basic way to multiply. And to get a monoidal structure on these sets of, of modular tensor categories, et cetera. And so, um, so, the, so, um, so we have, an, um, through the center construction, we can send any fusion category into a modular tensor category. It's not a one-to-one -one map, uh, but it's, it's you know it's close-ish to that, so who cares? So I, I'm lying here a little bit, but so um, so um, so given a fusion category, you get a modular tensor category. You can mod out in a sense that can be made precise, and uh, and what you end up with is a group called the Vit group. So you can explain the Vit group as following. So what I'm going to define an equivalence class on all nice VOAs, um, and so um, and so. Uh, so I, if I have a VOA and I tensor it with a, a holomorphic VOA, a holomorphic VOA means a VOA with a trivial representation theory. So the Leech Lattice VOA or um, the Moonshine module. So you tensor your, your VOA with a holomorphic VOA and you get an equivalent VOA. Um, so that's one thing you can do. Another thing you can do is extend your VOA. You start with your VOA and you do a finite extension or if you prefer a finite index um, sub, it, you find a finite index sub VOA of it. So, um, so you have three, so there's three things. So you have your, you can tensor your VOA with a holomorphic VOA, a, tri a rep trivial representation theory VOA. You can, um, you can look at a sub finite index sub VOA or the other way around, finite index extension. And so um, you say that V and W, or V and V tensor holomorphic, you say that they're equivalent to each other. You, you, the equivalence relation generated by these operations um, is, the, is the VIT equivalence relation. And, um, and uh, you, so you get, a, you get a, um, a set of equivalence classes that also, um, there's a multiplication of them through the Deline product. And, um, and so that's what, you, you get this short exact sequence, more or less. And so the conjecture is, as I've stated it here, it's not quite correct, but you, can, but you should tweak it a little bit. But the idea is that every VIT group um, class, every class on the right-hand side, uh, contains um, something from, coming from Lie theory, so one of these affine algebra, um, so one of these quantum group modular tensor categories. And, um, and so the, I don't know if that conjecture is true. There, there's, no, there's really not much evidence for that one. But, um, uh, it's a conjecture, and so it, may, it might be true, it might not be true, I don't have an opinion on that. Um, but um, if we assume that it's true, say, then, if we assume that it's true, then we, um, then what this is telling us is, if we're searching for exotic modular tensor categories, um, the place to look is fusion categories. So no matter what, uh, if you have an exotic fusion category, then probably its double, its center, is gonna be an exotic modular tensor category. You're gonna have to check that, but probably that's true. So certainly, exotic fusion categories is a source of exotic modular tensor categories. But um, if this conjecture is true, then it's the only source. So any exotic modular tensor category has to come from an exotic fusion category. So the reason this is important is because a fusion category is much simpler than a modular tensor category. And so uh, we can construct fusion categories much more easily than we can construct modular tensor categories. So what our task is going to be is to construct, to focus in, zoom in on fusion categories, find exotic fusion categories, then take their center, and then see if we can find the VOA corresponding to it. Okay, well there is an answer to the question, what's, um, what's the simplest exotic fusion category? And so um, the fusion category world is very closely connected to subfactors, and in fact, uh, almost all of the innovative methods in fusion categories, et cetera, have been stolen from the subfactor context. So, um, so one of the great things is they're they've they're pretty good at constructing um, these subfactors, and they found in the 19, late 1990s, Hogarup and a postdoc, I think, of Hogarup, Asayeda, found uh, found a, 
a very important, a, a very small subfactor that has, uh, that is exotic. So by exotic, I mean, we have three constructions for this right now. Maybe there's a fourth one that's found. But all these constructions are ad hoc. So they're just completely ugly methods. So you just roll up your sleeves, pull the curtains down, lock the door, get a big pitcher of beer, and just churn through um, some unpleasant um, work in order to construct this thing. So they're not fun things to do. There's no shortcuts using um, any, any methods that we have right now. So these are dumb ways to construct these things. But the thing is that, um, th that's kind of the thing. Until we develop the techniques, you have to use really dumb ways to construct these things. You can't rely on, on Lee theory or whatever. OK, um, so the construction that I find the most interesting is um, due to Azumi. And so that's the one I'm going to focus on right now. So it's actually a really, really neat idea. So uh, we're trying to create a fusion ring. So remember, a fusion ring is, um, has finally many simples, at least up to equivalents. And um, it has tensor products. So we have to have some way to define a tensor product. This tensor product has to be associative, but it doesn't necessarily have to be commutative. And um, it has duals, um, and it has direct sums, and I'm probably forgetting something else. So, um, um, so this approach to constructing a fusion ring um, trivializes the tensor product thing. So the idea is you have some algebra. So you'll see an example in a few seconds that'll become very concrete, more concrete than you ever wanted it to be. So you have some algebra. It's going to be a relatively simple algebra. And what we're going to do is the, the objects in our category are going to be um, endo algebra endomorphisms. So uh, they're going to take sums of elements to so f of x plus y is going to be f of x plus f of y. Um, and they're linear. So scalars, which are complex numbers here, slide through f. And, um, and finally, they're multiplicative. So, uh, it, so they're algebra endomorphisms. So f of x times y is f of x times f of y. So that's what our, um, that's what our things are. And, and, and if you're lucky or if, you're, if you want to be easier on yourself, then you can also make them Imagine that there's an involution, a star, like an adjoint, and this thing commutes with adjoints. But we're not going to assume that. So that's, how, what's, that's what your objects are. Um, and then we also have to say what your morphisms are. And so these are going to be intertwiners. And so um, you can see the definition there. It's a bit maybe strange looking, but it should look like the, the intertwiner definition for this. You'll see an example in a few seconds to make this clear. So multiplication is, you know, tensor product, is just composition of um, endomorphisms. The composition of two endomorphisms is an algebra endomorphism. And um, the associativity, well, pretty much the only thing on planet Earth that's truly associative are, um, are, um, is composition. And so the, algebra, the associativity constraints are, are all one. They're just the identity. So that complicated part of the whole fusion category world is, is eliminated. So not all, so um, yeah. So the difficult thing here is now addition, which normally is pretty trivial. Because if you have two, endomorph two algebra endomorphisms, f and g, and you add them together, then that's not an algebra endomorphism. Um, for example, you take it, if you apply it to the identity in your algebra, then so if f is an algebra automorphism and g is an algebra endomorphism, then the naive sum of these two things is a perfectly defined function, but it's not an algebra endomorphism. Because if I, if I take um, the unit in my, in my algebra, then I'm going to get f of 1 plus f of g of 1. I require that this be, um, that this preserve 1. So f has to send, this. so this is going to equal 1 plus 1. It's going to equal 2. So this thing here isn't uh, an algebra endomorphism. It doesn't preserve, um, it doesn't send the unit in my algebra to the unit in my algebra. So you have to be more clever about this. And the clue of how to proceed is you just steal the definition of direct sum from tensor category. So I flashed this last class, and I don't want to flash it again here. But you have these embeddings and projections. And it's like you look at R, N, R, R infinity as a sum of two copies of R infinity. One is on the even um, index. One has even indices, and the other one has odd indices. And you have F act on the even indices, and you have G act on the odd indices, and together um, you get an endomorphism on, you get a map on your full R infinity. So that's the idea. OK. So let's do a concrete example. So we, we start with a fusion ring. 
So you start with the combinatorial side. So for fusion categories, the combinatorics is a fusion ring. So here we're going to do the you know, pretty much the simplest fusion ring that there is. This is called the Yang Li Yi Li Yang or Yang Li model. And so um, this has two equivalence classes of, of simples. I'll call them one. This is the tensor unit, which always has to be there. And there's another guy that I'll call rho, just because what else you call it. And um, I need to explain how these things multiply. Well, of course, the tensor unit times anything is itself. It's the unit. And so the only thing that I have to talk, tell you about is what in the, happen, what in the world happens to rho, to rho multiplied by rho, so rho squared. And so up to equivalence, um, I'm going to require that this thing be uh, 1 plus rho. Okay. So this is the fusion rules for the Li Yang, Yang Li model. Now, um, so what we're going to do to construct this thing is, so what, what, so what we have to do is make sense out of this. We have to make sense of the sum here. And the way to do this is using these um, projections and these embeddings. So I'm gonna. So up there, I copy what um, was written on the slide last. Yes, la, uh, on Monday about what direct sum means in a fusion category. And so, um, so you get a bunch of relations that have to be satisfied. And um, so, if you embed um, your your copy of R infinity into the even um, index um, sub space of R infinity. If that's what T does, let's say, then S prime would project it, would project the odds to um, R infinity. And so if you do um, the embedding to the evens and then project only using the odds, that's what S prime T means, and that's going to equal zero, et cetera, et cetera. These are just, I'm just, there's nothing special about this. This is the definition of direct sum. Okay, now this is how we use this to try to find how to construct fusion categories. So this is what I mean by ad hoc methods. I'm not trying to impress you with the sophistication of these methods. So um, OK, so let's just see what this means. So I wrote down that rho squared of x of s. Let's see what that has to equal. Well, rho squared of x is going to equal s x s prime plus t rho of x times t prime. Right, that's what rho squared of x equals. And so if I also multiply it by s. So the small letters here are the elements in, um, in my algebra. Um, and s and t prime, et cetera, are all in my algebra. So if I multiply this out using distributivity, um, it's in algebra, then t prime times s is equal to 0. So this part cancels. And s prime times t is equal to 1. So these things cancel. And what I end up with is hopefully what I wrote down, which is s times x. Now, from the definition of morphism, which you've probably forgotten, at least I've forgotten, um, this says that this is exactly the definition of what um, it means for s to be in the uh, intertwiner of 1 and rho squared. Remember, our objects are the endomorphisms. It's kind of backwards from what you would have normally done. The objects are in the category are the endomorphisms, and the morphisms in the category are the elements of the algebra. OK. And so you continue on in this way, and you get um, a bunch of other things like that. Sorry. Yep? How you got the other relations out of the fusion ring? How you got the what, sorry? The SL. I don't know how, there's this line that says where S times S prime plus T plus times right. prime is equal to 1. How, that, how does that line follow from whatever is before that line? It, um, it follows from the definition, which I, don't, I would have to dig it up here, from what direct sum means in a fusion category. So how do you take direct sums in a fusion category? So um, you, have, um, you have morphisms that go in various directions. And so it, it, basically, it looks like that, actually. So that's how you define. A, um, so that's how you define a direct sum in a fusion category. But um, you don't have to take my word for it. Um, 
define it to be like this. And then there's a theorem that says that, that um, this set of data, you have to turn a crank, use item potent completion and stuff, but you get, uh, you get a fusion category out of this. So. But it, it's a all I'm saying is that it's a natural thing, actually, from the definition of direct sum in a fusion category. So it's what, you would, it's what you'd write down. OK. Now let's, let's uh, try to do the next line. So apparently, S prime rho S rho X, well, certainly that's true, because rho is, uh, um, is an algebra endomorphism. So certainly that's true. And now we use the, so now we use the fact that um, this should be the intertwiner statement here. So um, th this line here says that s times x, s times x is equal to this terrible mess here. This is the intertwiner statement. So I can replace s times s with um, rho squared x s. I'm forcing you, this on you just so that you, you see it once in your life. And you'll never want to see it again. But um, OK, then we get that. So that should be the next line I wrote down. And then uh, and now we just use this row. We distribute this row over everything. Again, using the endomorphism property, S prime. So this is row um, cubed, which I, want, which I want to write, I think, as 2 plus 1. No, I'll just write this as row cubed. Um, and this is x and row of s. So I'm writing this, I guess, as rho squared rho of that. So I can write rho cubed, certainly, as that way. OK, now what am I going to do? So now I use the intertwiner property again. This says that this is the intertwiner property for s prime. So, um, this, so this thing, when I flip it through, so I get rho x s prime rho s, I think. And what that tells me is this thing here is going to lie in palm of rho, rho. But rho is simple by hypothesis. And so end of rho is just the complex numbers, nothing more. So what we've learned is that a very important fact that s prime times rho of s is equal to some complex number that I call a or alpha. We'll find out. A, we call it a. So it's just some random complex number. And uh, maybe that's enough for calculations for now, because I'm taking way too much time. And so similarly, you get that t prime times rho of s equals b times t um, so let's just trust that. It's the same exact calculation, nothing deeper. None of this is deep. It's all elementary. So the proof that you get a fusion category out of this takes a bit more work, but it's all elementary, as it kind of has to be. You're, we're only allowed to use dumb methods because we, we're scared to use anything sophisticated because it's all 20th century. So um, what does rho of s mean? Well, rho of s, of course, is one times rho of s. Of that, there can be little doubt. And now let's just multiply all this out. So this is s times s prime of rho of s by distributivity plus t times t prime rho of s. But I've deri deliberately computed what s prime of rho of s is. It's a. So this thing is a of s, and this thing is the other thing is bt. So that's that. That's what rho of s is. And similarly, I'm not going to show the work, but um, you, you don't need anything. You can all do this yourself if you want. You can find out what rho of s prime is, rho of s t, rho of t prime is, in terms of 
in total, 10 complex numbers. So if you have 10 complex numbers, which are at this point unconstrained, then you know what rho does to, to s, s prime, t, t prime. And so that means that you know by the algebra endomorphism property, you know, uh, my slides I'll, I'll, rele I'll release. You can ask for them whenever you want, except for the next hour, and, um, and I'll give them to you. And if, so, uh, so I'll flash through, through this a little bit faster than maybe some of you may want. So we have 10 parameters, things like a and a prime, these are complex numbers. And in terms of that, we know how rho acts on the whole algebra. So who cares what your original algebra is? As far as this polynomial algebra on these things are, we know everything that there is to know about rho. OK, but there are constraints. These parameters aren't free. So one of the things is we know that s prime times s equals 1. So, and we know that rho has to be an uh, endomorphism, an algebra endomorphism. So 1 is equal to s prime s. That means that rho of 1, of course, has to equal rho of this. But rho is an algebra endomorphism. So we can write it like this. And rho is an al algebra endomorphism, so we can write this as just 1. So 1 has to equal this mess. But we know what rho of s prime is, and we know what rho of s is, because I wrote it up on a slide that's no longer here. And so you can stick it all together. And what you get is the relation that 1 is equal to, when you simplify out this and use the, the relations that we have, they're called Kuntz relations, then you get, you get this relation. So here's one relation between these 10 things and similar things. On my slide, I give some other ways you can get relations. And um, anyways, if you crank it all out, what you get are lots of relations involving these 10 um, numbers, and all of them are fixed. So for example, it turns out that A and A prime are the same, and they have to equal um, the golden mean, more or less. And so that, as oops. So the result um, are there's two different answers here. There's two different fusion categories. They're inequivalent to each other. One has the plus sign for A, and the other one has the minus sign for A. One of them turns out to be a unitary category. It's realized you can realize it by a VOA directly as the category of modules, where you forget the braiding. The category of modules for, for example, G2 at level one or F4 at level one. And the other, that's the plus sign one. The minus sign one is realized by um, the minimal model, the Yang-Li minimal model. Again, you forget the braiding. You get a modular tensor category, but every modular tensor category is a fusion category if you forget the braiding. So this is a way to find all of the, so this, this is, I'm sure was known a trillion years ago. So I'm not trying to say this is, this is just meant to be an example of, of this method. Apply it in the pretty much the easiest way, easiest case you could possibly look at. OK? So now let's do the same for the whole group, whole group Izumi series. So, um, so, the, so the whole group corresponds to G being um, Z mod 3. But, um, but, um, um, so, um, but we're going we to generalize this to any abelian group any of odd order. So you can also do it for the even ones, but it's a little bit more complicated. 2, as usual, mucks things up. So what we have are, so if we say this abelian group has order n, then um, we have 2n simple objects, or more precisely, equivalence classes of simple objects. So what I'm going to do is give you the fusion relations, and then, um, and then I'll tell you how, what, 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 what um, these kinds of equations give you. So the fusion relations are, so the, if you remember the, if you remember the, um, the fusion rules for the whole group, for the even part of the whole group, was look, it looked like sim three representations. So you had um, what we called A, so you have one A, A squared, and then A cubed equals one. And you also had um, the order two things, um, A times rho. And this commutes through this, this flips through this in the sim three way. And so the same for a squared. And um, so I guess I could write this as a squared. And um, lastly, uh, the most interesting one is what rho squared is. So if this was truly like sim 3, then the answer would be 1, the tensor unit. But here we have this, this weirdness, which is this. OK, this is what the whole group is like. And what, the, what Azumi. Um, found is that he could 
when he was trying to construct the Ho group, he could just as easily construct any odd G. So, so this is the group G. So just replace this with any odd abelian group. And so you get this, this same relation, and you get this same relation, where this will be the sum over all, um, all, you go right like this, all G in your abelian group. Okay, so you have the invertible ones, which just obey the rules in your group. Okay, so this is a, a yeah, this is an infinite series of, of possible. This is an infinite series of fusion rules. Um, one of which is the whole group. The first one of which is the whole group. Okay. Now, um, Azumi's theorem is that you get a unitary fusion category, wh whatever unitary means. Let's not worry about that. That realizes this fusion ring if and only if you have a bunch of numbers. So these are the analogs of the A, A prime, B, B prime, etc. In the last example, so you have a bunch of numbers. Um, naively, there's n squared of them, but there's lots of relations between these numbers. For example, this matrix is a Hermitian matrix, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so there's a bunch of meaningless equations there. But if you can solve these meaningless equations, um, and they're just polynomial equations in polynomial in complex numbers, well, there's some complex conjugates, but you can get rid of those. Um, then you get a fusion category. Now, um, so Azumi looked at um, Z mod 3, of course, the whole group case. And um, there you can see for yourself, there's only one unknown. It's A12. If you know this, everything else is determined. And um, the equations quickly collapse to just one a quadratic equation. And it has this as a solution. Again, there's a plus or minus. But in this case, the plus and minus solutions correspond to equivalent fusion categories. So you get one fusion category, and it's the whole group. Okay, so that's that. Well, it's not that, it's just the start, because um, Izumi also found a solution for g equals z5. And um, he didn't know um, if, if it stopped there or not. Like it, is it like E67, E8 for Lie algebras, where there's no E9, at least not in the same finite dimensional simple family? Um, but it turns out that there's lots and lots of other ones. Um, so it's not terribly hard to find solutions. And so I sicked my grad student, my master's student, on this. And so he found solutions for all odd groups up to 29, order 29. And um, they, f they come into a, a pattern um, in s of sorts. Um, but what's very unclear is um, the numbers, A, G, H's. So they weren't so bad for the whole group. It was just some quadratic irrationality. But in general, they're very bizarre looking. They're not psychotomic in general. Um, uh, there's no pattern that I can see to them. So, so this method, this Kuntz method, Kuntz algebra method, is, um, is, is certainly not the right way, I don't think, to prove infiniteness of these families. But I, I'm completely convinced that, um, that this is an infinite family. There are infinitely many um, fusion categories of the Hoberu Azumi type. OK, so. Um, that isn't where it stops. Um, so uh, there's another class of examples you could look at, um, near group examples. So what these have are simple objects. So what they're called near group because a group fusion ring would be something like vec G. So those ones would have simples just given by the elements of your group. And, um, and these are one higher. You have one more thing that you throw in. But we're, we're going to call row again just because that's what you just do. You call it row unless you have a lot of self-confidence. And so I call it row. And so um, your simple objects are all of the invertible Gs, all the elements of your group, along with row. And the fusion rules, the all-important fusion rules, are that um, G kills all of the rows. So G kills row, or sorry, row kills G. And, um, and the important one is what row square it is. And so um, the class that I'm going to talk about here um, seems to be the only interesting class, really which is that, um, uh, well, it's that fusion rule there. So n is the order of your group G. Here, your group G can be even or odd. It doesn't really change much if it's even. But again, it's an abelian group. And so um, you, can, you can proceed along as before. And what you get are a bunch of equations in a bunch of unknowns. I'm not going to write them down. And um, you can solve them pretty easily. And so once again, my grad student was um, happy enough to charge through and find a bunch of solutions. And so he didn't, he, by, by the time he was getting near the end, he was getting closer and closer to his defense date. So he didn't look very closely. 
And so we didn't find any, he didn't find any solutions for 27 and 29. So you know, that's a place to look. But um, I think it's just because he didn't look very hard. Um, and uh, Pinhas, who's, oops, yeah, Pinhas is doing um, a, sort of a hybrid between the, um, the whole group series and the near group series. Um, so, so you get, um, you get lots of fusion categories. What we're finding is you're getting lots and lots of new fusion categories, and they're exotic. So once again, the only ways we have to construct these are these hideous methods that don't have any structure, any mathematics to it really at all, except behind the scenes. Okay. So um, fusion categories are great. How am I doing for time? Fusion categories are great. Um, so um, as I've been trying to say over and over and over again, they're the modern analog of a finite group. But to get a VOA, um, at, least direct, at least directly, we need to construct the modular tensor category. So the, the idea is the VOA that corresponds to this whole group, for example, would be um, its, its category of modules, its representation theory, would be the modular tensor category associated to the whole group. And of course, what that is, is the center construction. So we apply the center. We look at the center of the whole group. And more generally, the center at all of these zillions of fusion categories that we've been constructing in recent years. Do, do you always get non-trivial center? You always get a non-trivial center unless you start with VEC. So, it's a, so the, the analogy... So the definition is completely stolen from ring theory, but um, the analogy breaks there. So um, for example, if you have a commutative ring and you take the center, you don't get back the same thing again here. You get sort of the double of the thing you started with. Um, and you always get, even for a completely, yeah, so anyway, the answer to your question is um, it'll always be non true It'll always be bigger than VEC unless you started with VEC. So it always gives you something, um, something non-trivial. Okay, and so we want to compute the doubles of these fusion categories, and more importantly, the, the thing that we're mostly interested in is the combinatorial shadow of this. So we want to know the modular data. That's like the character table of the finite group. And so um, this has been done. And so here, this is what it looks like for the double of the whole group. This looks pretty scary if you see it at once, but that's just because it's a 12 by 12 matrix, and any 12 by 12 matrix, even the identity, looks pretty scary if you show it to your, your, uh, your young son or something. And so this is, um, this is something that's not that complicated at all. So, um, it's, it's, so you can see the, these C's in the bottom right-hand corner aren't quite as random as it might look. So if you want to know what the C is in the third um, row and the fourth column, let's say, so that's going to be, um, so third row, fourth column, three times four is 12. And, um, and these are cosines, and it, it's mod 13, so it's the, the dihedral group there. So it's one, it should be one. So three, four, and it is indeed one. It's, so there's a formula for what those Cs are. I just didn't write it down. And similarly for what the T matrix is, those 13s, those C13s, um, you can see what the exponent there is. There's a formula for it. So this, it doesn't look bad at all. It's very clear how it generalizes to any, um, anything in the whole group Azumi series. Um, and all that. So that's what the modular data looks like. So actually, this looks remarkably simple. So it's, it's exotic category in the sense that we don't have any way to construct it except stupid methods. Um, well, stu I shouldn't say stupid methods. Um, but methods that, aren't, um, that don't have um, you know, kind of ugly methods. I think that's a safe, safe way to describe it. OK, so we have something like 50. Um, fusion categories of whole group type, and the, 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 these modular data have been computed for all of them. And um, what you end up with is, you can write it down in this way. Um, so I'm not going to spend any time on it. So you can just write it down in a block, in block form, and you can write it down. It, so it's, very, it's a very friendly thing, and in fact, the ingredients that go into it are really, uh, are really simple, familiar things. So the, for the modular tensor category point of view, or at least the modular data point of view, it looks like it's built up out of little pieces, little chunks of very familiar stuff, very non-exotic stuff. But it's put together in a way that, um, that we've never seen before in any other examples. So I don't want to waste your time on looking at this thing. Um, um, so, um, so what it looks like is you can build this from some kind of, um, um, you can kind of go against my strategy. I was trying to look for something truly exotic, and it looks like you can kind of build this up, but in a 
completely new way from um, simpler stuff. And, uh, and so um, you can do the same for the near group fusion categories. And so the even ones are a little bit more complicated, but still, all of them have modular data. You can compute it, and the modular data looks very similar, very analogous to the, that for the whole group. So once again, it's built up from pieces, chunks, um, put together in a, in a new way, but these chunks are boring, are, are completely, um, completely trivial. So I'm very, very confident that there is a new construction. So what's, what we're going to really get out of this is a new construction. So, uh, so a new way to construct from boring fusion categories, um, new fusion categories, or actually new modular tensor categories. And so, um, so that's the gift. So it's an exotic construction method. So anyways, we have lots and lots of exotic fusion categories and, all, and there's more. So this is, my, um, this is what I mean by this construction. So this is uh, my genera generalization of Pinhas and Azumi's generalization of Evans and my generalization of the modular data of the center of the whole group. And so um, I don't want to waste too much time on this because uh, I want to get onto other stuff, but I just want to show you how simple it is. So there is a construction of modular tensor categories. This, I've used the word conjecture lots of times in my talk, but this is truth. It's just not truth that we've proven yet. There is a way to construct modular tensor categories from really simple things. It's an exotic construction. Even physicists don't know about this yet. Um, and this is what it looks like. It's extremely simple. And um, so you can run through all of the obvious tests. Um, so for example, the fusion coefficients are are um, positive integers. You can use Verlinda's formula to calculate fusion coefficients. Um, you have to get a representation of SL2Z, which you get. It has to have a congruence group in the kernel, which it always has, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so this is something that lives on the bottom level of that tower. And um, so I'm claiming, I'm conjecturing that it lifts to the middle level. So um, I, I'm calling it a smash sum because you're adding the the simples. So you're, you're combining two things, and these, the simples for your combined thing is, is kind of the union. It's the union of the, um, of the simples for the two things where you throw away something. So it's kind of like the symmetric difference. Is that the word for it? You, th you pick the union and you throw away the overlap, kind of. And so that's what's going on here. Um, so I think that um, there's a very general construction at the level of modular tensor categories. Um, Sorry, yes. Is the symmetry between C and C prime there? Um, what is the, sorry, say that again? What is the symmetry between C and C prime? It means like, so the last claim is that this, this modular tensor category is equivalent to C. Yes, so um, C and C prime are not isomorphic. They're not treated, there, there's an order to the sum. It's not at all a commutative thing. So, um, so you can see that actually when I talk about the central charge. So I write down the central charge or uh, here on the first line there, when I say t cubed equals minus t cubed. So the central charges are going to be off by 4 mod 8 between C and C prime. So they're different, um, so they're, they're different categories, but there is an overlap that's given by this, um, by this, uh, these, the, the A and the A prime subcategories. So there's an overlap that, that coincides, but otherwise they're different categories. So yeah, so that's one of the many things that's a bit mysterious. So the C prime affects sort of the orbifold. So you start with sort of a C thing, like a, a VOA, the VOA started associated to C, and then you, um, and then um, C prime somehow controls the, the reduction, I guess. Okay, well, if you believe in the reconstruction conjecture, and as I say, more and more people are tentatively leaning that way, I think, then you believe that these um, exotic modular tensor categories are realized by exotic VOAs. Uh, but um, we, that's, that's a cheap answer. So let's try to go a bit further. So here's a suggestive calculation. I don't know what this calculation means at all, but it's true. So if you have vector valued modular forms for C and for C prime, so these would be, for example, the, the graded dimensions of your, of your VOA, then you can create vector valued modular forms for this smashed sum. This is for any of these smashed sums uh, that I talked about on the previous slide. 
And so it's a very simple connection. The only thing that's involved that's a bit weird, there's some minus signs. So these things will have minus signs in them. So they can't be true characters. Um, and you also have this square root of j minus some random number. So um, this is a super character of a super conformal field theory. So this suggests maybe that the, this construction lives in the world of super VOAs, perhaps. But this also suggests to me that actually the more structure you look at, the, the simpler and simpler and simpler this smash sum seems to be. So um, I'm thinking that maybe it lives at the level of VOAs, actually. And then, um, and then well, if you, if you have your VOA, then you have its category of modules. And so you can compute that, and it'll be derived from C and C prime. Um, and it'll give you what I just talked about on the previous slide. And so that's, that's a little bit more complicated, but still pretty simple. And then um, if, you, if you are in the situation where you have a, a double, where your, where your modular tensor category is the double of something, then you can take the square root of that something and you get your fusion category. But that square root is an unwholesome thing to try to do. Uh, and so you're going to get a mess. And that's why you get these terrible numbers, AGHs, that I talked about earlier. So the whole thing, so it's kind of the flip of what you would have expected. You would have expected the fusion category to be the simplest and the VOA to be the hardest. But actually, it's kind of looking like the VOA is the easiest, and then it trickles down to the most concrete level, um, the fusion category level. So I haven't spent much time at all thinking about this, and I would love to think about this. For me, this is one of the most important things on my desk, is to try to understand the smashed sum construction, an exotic construction of, of, um, of these categories, modular tensor categories, et cetera, VOAs, ultimately, um, which were inspired by these, the search for exotic fusion categories. OK. So, um, so let's, let's address the question of whether there is a possible VOA associated to the double of the whole group. So um, what I've done in the past um, decade or so is, um, is come up with fairly effective ways to come up with character vectors, um, so vector-valued modular forms, um, that transform under the modular data. And so you can apply this to the whole group, and you pretty quickly get the answer. These are all of the possible character vectors for the whole group at c equals 8. So the, the, the whole group is going to be contained inside with finite index inside a holomorphic VOA. So it, its central charge, if you know what that means, has to be a multiple of 8. And we're in the unitary setting here. And so it's going to be a, um, so anyway, c equals 8 is the first place to look. And what you get is it looks pretty complicated. And you can see some minus signs in there. But those are, imag those are imaginary minus signs. So you have, there's two answers. There's exactly two answers, two character vectors um, that, are po that could possibly happen. One of them is gamma equals 0. One of them is gamma equals 1. And so then you get positive integer coefficients everywhere, and, um, and that's that. So the most important number here is probably the, so the first call, the first row is the greater dimension of the VOA itself. And so uh, it starts with a q to the minus 1 because there's only one. So v naught equals c, c times the vacuum, or c times 1. So that's that, that's that first coefficient. So that's a boring co coefficient. The next coefficient, though, is the dimension of a Lie algebra, a reductive Lie algebra that's contained inside the whole group. And it acts on everything. In fact, um, a loop algebra of it, an affinization of, of that thing, its loop algebra, acts on all of the modules. So, um, so that first thing there is a reductive Lie algebra of dimension 6 or of dimension 19, and it controls everything. And so the next step is to try to understand what that Lie algebra is and how does it act on everything. And so um, the best way to do that, I think, is using Jacobi forms. I played around with poking at, at this using other um, vector-valued modular forms. But um, vector-valued Jacobi forms is the way to go. So these are affine algebra characters, basically. Or they're at least they're, complex, they're built from affine algebra characters. And so um, and those are Jacobi forms, vector-valued Jacobi forms. So that's what, that's what we should do, is have a good effective theory of Jacobi forms, vector valued Jacobi forms, and, and, um, and then you can get more and more information. If you have the full story, you get the full um, Lie algebra story for this. Or you see that it can't exist, that there's no consistent. Yep. Right. Um, right, so what this is, so, um, okay, so we have q to the two-thirds, 
and we're multiplying it by q to the minus one. So this is q to the minus one third, which is equal to q oh, to the yeah, minus sorry, eight over yes, twenty-four. Yeah. It's a dumb. It's dumb for me to put sort of the q squared. Q, anyways, whatever. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So we'll go to that next slide. Uh, no, we won't get to that next slide. Or maybe we will. Let's see. OK, I'll, I'll, we'll come to that. So um, yeah, we'll come to that. So um, yeah, it's a great question. So there's people here that could address this question directly. So I haven't tried to construct very seriously the whole group, because the whole group VOA, because that's not my world. But we have world-class VOA constructor people in the audience, and so, um, so, okay, um, okay, I, I've lost my stream, stream of consciousness here, um, right, so, um, okay, so these things, so this, the whole group VOA, if it exists, is, lies inside, well, I'm, I'm, it looks like it lies in two different ways, at least, inside the E8 um, lattice VOA, a holomorphic VOA, and so, we should think of this as, an orbifold, or we could think of this as an orbifold, whatever that means, of E8 by the whole group fusion category, the whole group, the even part of the whole group subfactor, whatever that means. Um, um, so it's the first term in the, maybe a clue to what's going on is, is the following argument. So um, the whole group is the first term in the whole group Zumi series, but there's really a zeroth term as well. And that, so that would correspond to your group being just one. So not Z mod three, but Z mod one. It's a perfectly fine group. And um, in that case, we do have the VOA that corresponds to it. And it's, the, um, it's G2 level one plus F4 level one. So it's just an affine algebra VOA, but it's a very weird one. So in a sense, the whole group is a generalization of this, of this, weird, um, this weird VOA. Weird, but very non-exotic VOA. Now you can think of, so maybe a way to start would be to try to interpret G2 level one, F4 level one. So this, as you know, is a conformal embed, or as you might know, is a conformally embedded into E8, the lattice VOA. You construct it as an action of, of the FIB category on E8. And so in the same way, the whole group would be the action of the whole group on E8, um, but you can actually do better I'm not sure what the capital A is there for, but, um, um, and so, yeah, the answer to your, your to Sven's question is that um, there's an extension of this that is in, so this is actually a sub VOA of A2 plus E6 lattice theory. And so it's, it's sort of, it's one rank. So the kind of thing that you're doing to get G2 F4 from E8 is the kind of thing that you have to do to A2 E6 to get the whole group VOA. What is FIB? What is what? F I B. F I. Oh, FIB. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So that's um, so that's the category that uh, is the one I've just written down. So um, it's it's um, it's this fusion. It's it's a fusion. It's a. It looks like um one and rho or one and x, and x squared equals one plus x. So it's if you look at its dimension. Sorry? Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's right. So, so, and so if you look at the dimension, the, the word fib comes from, you look at the dimension of this thing, and um, it's the golden mean, which sounds like Fibonacci numbers. So someone came up with the obscure way to call this Fibonacci category. But that, that's, that's just what it is. So it's, it's some um, realization of, of that, um, those fusion rules on, uh, on your category. Okay, so um, I'm going to change to something completely different in my next 15 or 20 minutes. Are, are there any questions on that? So again, the strategy was we're searching for, trying to search for exotic um, beasts. And um, um, so the way to go, I think, is to look for exotic tensor categories. In particular, look for exotic fusion categories. Because that's, we have machinery that we've been developing over the last few years to do exactly that. And when we apply this machinery, so this is my suspicion, it's a heavy... It's a, it's a heavy telescope. It's, it's a, 
so it's very hard to lift it and point it at anything very interesting. You have to aim at things pretty close to the horizon. And, but whenever you, you point it at something, it seems like you find um, the first one or two stars that you see are, are known. They were known um, to the Neanderthal. But once you get past the first one or two um, stars, then you see um, what looks like an infinitude of, of completely new things. And these aren't just new in, th in that we hadn't seen them before, but they aren't constructible in, in any normal way. So you need, you need new constructions to construct these things. And so my suspicion is, if you point this thing anywhere, you're going to find this kind of a thing. I think that we know 0% of the fusion categories in the world. Um, so, there's, so what we're seeing here for the whole group case is typical, uh, I would guess. So, it, so most fusion rules you write down aren't going to be categorizable into a fusion category, but, but lots and lots and lots and lots of them are. And so once you have a fusion category, you get a modular tensor category, and then um, probably you get a VOA. And um, so I think, there's, I think actually there's lots and lots of exotic stuff out there that are waiting for us to discover. We just don't have the tools yet to discover them. And maybe this smash sum is a tool that, that could work. So if there's no comments or questions, then I will proceed with a completely different thing. OK, let's proceed with another example, I think, of the use of, of uh, tensor category methods for, um, for very basic questions that VOA people might be interested in. So what we're going to talk about are um, extending um, the VOAs of affine algebra type, which is an old question. Affine algebra VOAs are pretty much the prototypical um, rational VOAs. And so you, one of the questions you eventually will ask is, what, how, how can you extend them? And the question has meaning to, to formal field theory people, as we'll see shortly. And um, some work was done, actually work has been done on this for 30 years or more, um, since 1986, I think, whatever that is. So that's 40 years ago, 40, 35 years ago. And, um, and, uh, and tensor categories have provided the, the a really big final piece of the puzzle. So that's what I want to talk about. So in the beginning, there was Capelli et Zubert. Um, and in 1986, they, they were interested in classifying. So this was just when conformal field theories, two-dimensional conformal field theories, were sort of reaching consciousness of people. And, um, and so they were interested in classifying the conformal field theories that had this affine algebra SL2 symmetry. So um, Witten had just introduced these um, these sigma models, these Vesemino Witten models, and uh, so Capelli, Itzik, and Zuber wanted to um, find all of them. And so the idea is that um, your full CFT um, contains um, these two VOAs, which are usually, in practice, isomorphic. So you have, say, two copies of, of um, the, the SL2 level K um, VOA. This is your left moving chiral and your right moving chiral algebras. And uh, the full CFT that, that you ultimately are interested in um, is going to be gluing these two, splicing these two things together. And uh, so, um, so this corresponds to, in the, in the language of string theory, most of these will correspond to um, strings living on, on compact Lie groups. So these are the vesemino witten models. So examples of such full, v, uh, full CFTs are um, strings living on SU2 and strings living on SO3. Um, but there's some other examples as well, and they wanted to find all of them. Okay, so as we all know, um, these affine algebra VOAs are very nice. They're rational. Um, so in particular, A1 level K has finitely many modules up to equivalence. They're parameterized by the highest weights. And I'm shifting my highest weights by the vial vector, so just to make formulas a little bit cleaner. So instead of saying from 0 up to K, I'm saying from 1 up to K plus 1. Um, and so we get our greater dimensions, or what some people unfortunately call characters of these VOAs, and um, they carry a representation of the modular group. This is just the modular data that we've been talking about. And um, here's a formula for the modular data. That's probably correct. Might not be, though. Actually, every formula I write down, there's a non-trivial chance it's wrong. Um, and so how do these chiral algebras splice together? Well, the idea is that you have your, um, your VOAs act on so you have your, your VOAs, they act on your total space of states, and it decomposes it into, uh, into well, this sum that you see here. So script H, Cal H is the, 
space of states, and so decompose it into a finite sum over these highest weights that I've just mentioned. So what you get is a matrix. So you can collect these multiplicities, these Z, lambda, mu's into a matrix. And so this is often called the modular invariant because it commutes with the modular, the modular data, the modular group representation. So the, yeah, whatever. And so, um, so these are non-negative integers. Um, they're normalized so that you have a one in the upper left corner and um, they commute with the matrices S and T that I wrote down before. So S and T are pretty simple matrices. This is what they look like again. So it's not inconceivable that you can write down, um, you can actually classify these things, and that's what Capaldi, um, Tixon, and Zubert did, and they got the following answer. So you can write it as, you can write it in terms of a matrix, but almost all entries are zeros, so it's easier to write it in terms of some kind of a generating function, if you want to call it that. So that's what we're going to do, and this is their answer. Um, so you get um, the string that lives on SU2, um, so that's, that corresponds to the diagonal matrix. So the diagonal matrix commutes with everything in sight. It has a one in the upper left-hand corner, and all of its entries are non-negative integers. So it certainly is a solution. It's always a solution. Uh, it's a pretty boring solution, and it corresponds to the simply connected manifold, SU2 itself. Um, you have an invertible object here, um, corresponding to the symmetry of the extended Dinka diagram. So extended Dinka diagram uh, A1 has, this is A1's Dinka diagram, and this is A2's Dinka diagram with, I don't know how many lines you want to put in there, but lots of lines, and uh, certainly more than one. But anyways, there's a symmetry here that goes like this, and so this is, corresponds to what are called simple currents. Um, these are invertible objects in your category, in your, in your modular tensor category. So invertible just means that if you take your object and you multiply, there's some other, there's some inverse, some other simple object, which when you multiply them together, you tensor them together, you get the tensor unit. So it's going to be the dual of the object you started with. So these are invertible. And um, so you can extend by these simple currents. This is very simple and easy to understand. And that corresponds to strings that live on SO3, so the quotient of SU2 by the center of SU2. And um, so that, these are all very obvious and known for a long time. The interesting part is what comes next. And so um, it turns out there's exactly three other exceptional things. One corresponds to strings that live on SP4, so C2 level one. Um, there, A1 is contained in there with finite index, A1 level 10. So, um, so you, you, can, you can forget some of the C2 structure, the SP4 structure, and interpret it in terms of SL2. And similarly, for G2 at level 1, that corresponds to um, level 28, or shifts at level 30. And then you have an oddball at level 18. OK, so this is one of the most celebrated results in CFT for lots of reasons. OK, to me, this look, would look like completely like noise. If I were to have been lucky enough to work on this and do this and accomplish it, then I would have left it at that and felt proud of myself. But these guys were different. And so what they did is they noticed something that was pretty special. They noticed that these fall into an ADE pattern for reasons that I, I uh, unless you ask me, I'm, I'm not going to get into. And so, um, the, so, uh, for, so we'll talk more about exactly how to get these data diagrams from these um, full CFTs. But um, so these are the ADEs. I, I don't know why I wrote this down. But there they are. Um, so, um, so th these things, their answer ta falls into the ADE classification. Okay, so I'm not exactly sure why I did that, but I did that. Okay, now there's another ADE that um, um, we're all familiar with, and this is um, the finite subgroups of SU2. So, um, for example, if we look at the binary icosahedral group, then um, you can associate it to the extended E8 diagram. So the, the Kapelitz and Zuber graphs are non-extended ADE, and these are extended ADE. Um, so what you have here are, you have, um, so to every irreducible module of the binary icosahedral, in this case, you attach a node. You have a node. Now there's a defining representation, namely the two-dimensional one. This is the embedding of binary icosahedral inside SU2. And so, um, and so, um, and so that's that's the, the one that I'm going to call two here. So it's a two-dimensional one. 
And um, you get all the other, you connect these nodes by how they tensor. So you take the, 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 this representation I just said, the defining representation, the embedding representation, and you tensor it with the trivial, and you get just itself. And so you connect one with two. You tensor the defining one with two itself, and what you get is three plus one. And so you connect two with three, et cetera, et cetera. And you do all this, and, um, and what you end up with is the extended E8 diagram. OK, I'm, I'm assuming you've all seen this before. And so, but this suggests that you should have a similar um, interpretation for, for the conformal field theory graphs. And so you should have a way to multiply. You should be a way, find a way to get the edges of these graphs. And, um, and so this corresponds to something called the NIMREP. I'm running out of time. So I think what I'm going to, my strategy for today is just to set up the story. So, um, so you get an idea of a NIMREP. So a NIMREP is going to be your fusion ring. It's going to multiply by stuff on your, it's going to multiply, um, um, well, it turns out they're boundary states uh, on your CFT, and you get um, a representation of the fusion ring, and in, in a very similar way to how you build up the graph in the Mackay case, you build up the graphs in this sense, and what you get is indeed the ADE graphs of, of the CIZ classification. Okay. So this is where um, conformal field theory people kind of left the scene and the subfactor community took over. So as I said, this, this whole area owes the connection of tensor categories to, uh, to VOAs, et cetera, owes an awful big debt to the subfactor people. And um, so um, we now have a categorical interpretation of what's going on. And so this is what's going on. Um, and so when I say that we're going to talk about classifying um, CFTs corresponding to SL3 or whatever, this is what we mean. So, um, so we talked la on Monday about how uh, a fusion category you should think of as the categorification of a ring. And so um, that's a great picture because everything you can do with rings, um, you can try to see what it means in the, cat in the context of a fusion category. For example, the center of the ring we've seen corresponds to the modular tensor category associated to this fusion category. Another thing you can do with rings is you can look at their modules. And um, so if you do that, the categorification of a notion of a module of a ring uh, is called a module category. It's kind of a bad name because we've also talked about categories of modules. And so module categories and categories of modules are totally different. So there's no intertwining going on here at all. There's no commutativity. These are totally different concepts. A module category is, um, um, well, let's skip. So. I'll, I'll just describe it in two ways. One way is it's the categorification of the module of a ring. So you can do that in your own way. You should know how to do the categorifications on your own. And, um, and, but from our point of view, the real way to think about a module category is as a triple. This is the way that makes sense to the VOA people, to the CFT people. So we're thinking of, so a module category is meant to parameterize the possible full CFTs in the Capelli Itzik Son Zuber. Um, way to think about it. And so um, what you can do if you, you have, let's say, your two copies of SL2 at level K, so these are your left and right chiral algebras, then, um, then what you can do is look at all of the, the pure holomorphic quantum fields, um, extend your one of your A1 level K things by all of those purely holomorphic ones, and you get a new VOA that we'll call left. And you can do the same for the other chiral algebra, the other VOA, the other copy of A1 level K. You can extend by all of the anti-holomorphic um, quantum fields, whatever that means. And um, what you end up with is a new um, VOA that we'll call right. And then, um, and then you have to splice these things together. But if they're maximally extended, then it has to be a tensor equivalence. So what your triple consists of is you maximally extend the left, you maximally extend the left, you maximally extend the right, and then you have your identification of the two maxim maximal extensions. So it's a triple. And so in terms of this matrix Z that we're talking about, um, I seem to, oh no, I describe it on this slide. So um, in terms of the matrix Z that we're talking about, um, what you have is your, you have 
you have three ingredients that go into the matrix Z. Your modular invariant. There's three ingredients that go into it. So one ingredient is your branching rules, or if you prefer, restriction. So this goes from your left VOA, so it's called VOA left. So your maximally extended holomorphic chiral algebra, um, it restricts down to the VOA that you started with, which in our case is A1 level K, but it doesn't happen to be. And so you have a restriction thing. So for every simple object over here, you can write it as a, um, as a, as a sum of simples over here with multiplicity. And so you get a matrix out of that. Let's call this matrix B left. You do the same for the maximally extended right side of this. Your, VO, your full VOA has two halves, two VOAs associated to it. So do the same for the right. Now your transfer equivalence corresponds to a permutation matrix. So let's call this permutation matrix pi. I don't know what I call it, but let's call it pi. And so pi is going to be the permutation matrix that identifies the simples of V left with the simples of V right. And then you multiply all these in the only way that you can that makes sense, which hopefully is the way I wrote down there. BR um, multiplied by the permutation matrix, which is no longer called pi, um, times the transpose of the other branching matrix. And you end up with the matrix Z that we had before. So that's the modern way to think about the modular invariance. And of course, there's more structure to it, and that's the whole point. OK, so I'm running out of time. So, but I'll just finish with this slide. And so this is the way to think about the capelli itzig son zuber classification, the ADE classification for um, SL2. So the A modular invariants, these are the ones that correspond to the identity matrix. Well, there's not much room for anything here. In fact, nothing happens. You have a trivial extension. So V left is just this, V right is just this, and the, um, the identification here is the identity. And that gives you the identity matrix. Half of the Ds correspond to um, trivial extensions, but a non-trivial um, tensor um, equivalence built from simple currents, these invertible objects. And the other half of the D series, so the odds correspond to this and the evens to the other, the other way around. The other one, the other part of the D series corresponds to extensions. So both the left and the right correspond to simple current extensions of this thing, and you have a trivial isomorphism between those two extensions. So pi is 1, but the branching rules are non-trivial. And um, you, then you have the three, other, the three other exceptionals. Two of them correspond to the similar sort of a story, exceptional extensions. Left and right are the same, and the isomorphism is the trivial one. And finally, um, the middle one, the E7, invariant. In some ways, it's the weirdest one. It involves an extension. It's a boring extension by simple currents, but a non-trivial um, tensor equivalence. And so that's the story for CFTs um, associated to SL2. OK, so what we're going to talk about on Friday, we're going to start talking about, is um, what happens in higher rank. And, uh, and so for that, it's going to turn out we're going to very quickly need non-trivial input from tensor categories. Are there any questions? Yep. Where does module casual words? Yeah, so the module, right. So um, the module category. Um, yes, I think I talked about this. So this is um, um, Fuchs, Runkel, um, Schweiger, et cetera, um, have explained how if you start with your, um, you start with your, your the, the modular tensor categories of the left and the right, which, which might be the same, they might not be the same, and then you have a, a module category between the two, then they tell you how to construct all of the correlation functions for that. So they tell you how all of the data that you'd want to know, at least at a categorical level, for these, um, for, uh, for this, for that, for that choice of module category, how, how you could how you can do it. But the extension, the idea that the module category is a line-wise module object. 
Yeah, so. Well, if it, only if it's a commutative algebra object. So, so if it's if it's not, so if it's not necessarily commutative, then you're going to get, uh, you know, then it'll be of mixed type, or maybe it'll be a pure automorphism type. Who knows? But yeah, so uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, so uh, right. So you, you can think about this in terms of the algebra object, especially if it's a pure extension type. That's a very good way to look at it. Other questions? Raimondo? In the, usual, in the usual picture of uh, you have a vertex algebra and a group acting there, and I'm looking at your model, then you, you can extend the category. You look at more than just modules from you, but this module is going to take up the group acting there. So now, in your, in your model, that I should think of these categories as groups. Do I have something like this? That yeah. Right, we do, and so um, I'm not sure if I'll be. Uh, I'll tr I'll try to make sure I talk about this on on tomorrow's thing. But yeah, that's a crucial part of the whole story. Yeah, that's right. So you have this, and so for example, next, so near the beginning of, of Friday, we'll talk about induction, and so the target of induction is is this sort of twisted module thing, not just not just for a group case, but for the weird for a fusion category case. So that's the way you, sh you have to think about it that way. There's, there's a fusion category, but a fusion category with extra structure, that, um, and then you have your modular tensor category. So you sort of have a triangle. That's right. So C prime is going to be, yeah, so C prime, uh, so, but it's, it might not be in exactly that sense because I don't know what's going on. I haven't given it more than a probably half an hour of thought, unfortunately. But, um, but uh, yeah, it's going to be something. So in some ways, C prime controls the algebra. Other questions? If not, let's thank the speaker. So this is the end of the morning session.